Okay, welcome. I uh, hope you all enjoyed your weekend. Uh, we've got a few classes left uh, until our midterm exam, which is next week. So I'm going to talk a little bit this morning about what's coming up, what to expect. Uh, next week, we'll be doing some review sessions uh, to help you prepare for your midterm as well. So um, it's always happens. I think one of these days I would remember. So upcoming classes and events. We've got a few the three more content lectures uh, until the midterm. Uh, so that gives you a little bit of buffer time between when we finish our content and what you actually have to uh, study for. So today we're going to talk about memory and rehearsal. So we'll talk about uh, elaborative rehearsal and maintenance rehearsal and memory. Uh, I have an online lecture, uh, which is actually on memory errors uh, rather than memory in the brain uh, and retrieval uh, we're going to discuss uh, on Wednesday. Um, there's a little bit of additional content on memory in the brain in the chapter in the textbook, uh, which you can also uh, read uh, and, dis um, and, and cover for the exam coming up. Uh, so again, three lectures this week, two in person and one online as usual. Uh, and next week, uh, what we'll talk about is, here we go. Um, so we're gonna have a review session on Monday. So this time next week, we have Monday lecture time scheduled, but no new content. Uh, so I'm not going to discuss any new information, but what I'll do is I'll use that opportunity to review some of the material from way back at the beginning of the term, uh, which probably seems like, I don't know, when did the term begin? Like September something. So that's like a long time ago, and it seems like a long time ago. So I want to recover, you know, cover some of the stuff that we talked about a few weeks ago. Uh, I also want to cover anything that you specifically think you'd like to spend a little bit more time discussing, uh, which we can do in class. You can ask questions or you can send questions ahead of time uh, on the team site so that I can have those in place. And I'll also go through some um, practice multiple choice questions uh, so that we can discuss the kinds of multiple choice questions that you can expect. Uh, so it'll be a general review session. It's optional. I mean, I guess all classes are optional, really. If you don't want to, you don't want to come. It's your option. Uh, but I'll be here, obviously, and I'm going to run through some material. Uh, but there'll be no new content uh, to cover. Uh, we also have our second quiz on Monday. Uh, run the same way as quiz one. Uh, it'll be uh, from 11 to 11. Uh, it will be online. Uh, the difference is I've cut the number of questions from 20, from 18 down to 15. I think that'll be a little bit more forgiving uh, for the 15 minutes that you have. Otherwise, it'll be the same format. Uh, so whatever you did for the uh, first quiz, do for the second quiz, and then a very short turnaround time to our exam, uh, which will be a two-hour exam, uh, approximately 80 questions of the same variety of questions, but different questions than you got on your quiz. That's a little bit more forgiving uh, in terms of the timing. Uh, so it will be fewer questions per minute. Uh, it's a long time. I mean, you could probably keep up with the one question a minute if you needed to, but not for two hours. Uh, so it, there'll be a little bit more time per question. Same format, 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. It's going to be run on OWL. It'll also be open note, open book, uh, and run in roughly the same way as the quiz. It'll kind of just be like a whole bunch of quizzes uh, in a two-hour period. Are there any questions on that? And I'm going to talk more about that next week when I do the review. Yes. Uh, should we expect our quiz results back by like Tuesday morning? I'll try to have them all back by Tuesday morning. Yeah. So uh, what I did last time, I think you can all see the answers, uh, your answers, as well as the correct answers. I'm not going to use those items again. Uh, I won't be using them again uh, for at least another year or so. Uh, so I don't mind you seeing those questions. If I were using them again for uh, makeup exams, uh, makeup exams will have different questions. Uh, so I don't mind those things being given out. Uh, certainly for the quizzes, I'm only going to have those on quiz. If you're planning to take a makeup quiz, you'll have different items uh, than were on the uh, standard. Any other questions? Yes. Do we have class on the 27th on the day of the quiz? No, actually we don't. Uh, you got the whole day. <laughs> uh, I'm assuming you all have uh, other midterms, right? Uh, and other assignments. This is a terrible time of the year. Uh, for if you're a student, right? I know it's how busy it is. So yeah, we do not have a, a separate class that day. So our last real content class will be this week. 
review session on Monday, and then that's it until after the, the, the break. Yes. Is the exam on the textbook and the lecture? Yes, the exam will be on lecture and textbook material. The emphasis is always on stuff that I've discussed in lecture that also appears in the textbook. Uh, but all of the material that we cover in the class, uh, whether it's stuff that I talk about in person, uh, online, uh, or it's just in the textbook chapters, uh, is a possible uh, source for questions for the exam. What questions be organized by IT again? I'm not sure how I'm going to do it yet. Uh, I think what I'm probably going to do is organize them uh, into uh, possibly some by group, but then randomize within that. I'm not sure yet. I might end up randomizing them across the board if I can. Part of the problem is trying to figure out the best way to get Al to work so that uh, it doesn't give everybody exactly the same quiz in the same order with the same items. One thing I won't do, though, is I will make sure that if the if there's a uh, all of the above, that it doesn't appear <laughs> as item D or as item A or something like that. I won't randomize items for things that uh, count. But yes, I, I haven't answered that question yet because I haven't built the online. I haven't finished building the online exam yet. Yes. Uh, so will you have like exam questions uh, based on the textbook that was not covered in the lecture? Yes, that can happen. So the emphasis will still be on things that I do cover in lecture, the majority of things. That will, uh, that, that tells you what you should probably focus the most on. What do you say like the uh, ratio is from lecture to the textbook? I'm gonna say probably at least 80% of stuff that's covered in lecture, uh, the majority of it. And just as an example, you probably remember one of the questions on the uh, quiz, which was about a mental image of a hamster and a hippopotamus. I know I spoke to a few of you about that. That's an example of a multiple choice question that is a topic that we talked about in class in the lecture, but requires you to think about it in a different way. Right? So I didn't use that exact example, but if you remembered what you remembered and learned the right things about mental imagery, you would have been able to answer that question. Uh, but yeah, at least 80% will be stuff that we've covered in lecture. Uh, so there will be some stuff that comes from the textbook we haven't uh, covered directly in lecture, but the majority of it is stuff that I like to talk about. Any other questions? And I can continue to answer these questions uh, on Teams and Monday as well. Yes. Uh, should we expect a new question where you can select more than one answer? Uh, maybe, I actually don't know. Um, I haven't put any of those in yet, but that sounds like a good idea. So uh, yeah, it's possible. There might be some <laughs> like that. Yes. Um, is it, it going to be like in person and then like kind of online in a half, or is it just going to be like the only the in-person class? Like, would you do like a review online afterwards and have the questions in class or like what? I didn't hear the very first part of your question, sorry. Um, so like, is it gonna be online? Like, is there gonna be an online half to the Monday? Uh, it, yeah, so the, okay, I, yes. The question was, is it gonna be an online component? Yes, I'll run the questions online as I do here. So I'll have a live stream open. Uh, if you have questions that come up on the chat, for example, uh, I can check throughout the session as well. Uh, so I won't run a separate online review session. I do have office hours on Mondays as well. So that's also another option. Um, but yes. Anything else before we get started today? Yeah. Are we able to go back and forth in the exam question? No, I won't have it go back and forth. I'm trying to figure out a way to have you go back and forth within a small chunk, but I don't know if I can yet. Um, there's several different ways to present online tests, as you know, I can use OWL, I can use Gradescope, I can use Qualtrics, I can proctor them. Uh, all of these have pros and cons. Uh, the, the way I'm doing it is that we won't have the proctoring, so you won't have to uh, use the proctor track or whatever the software is. But the downside is in order to do that, I've selected the sort of single presentation, nonlinear format. I'm trying to figure out a way to give you a little bit of leeway on that, but I haven't made that change yet. So likely it's going to be one question. Uh, any other questions? Oh, and I do apologize for having a little bit of uncertainty yet. I'm still trying to figure out, as I said, the best way to get the exam uh, running to solve all those concerns. By Monday's review session, the exam will be done. So I'll know the answer to some of those questions. Are we good to go on? 
Okay, so let's review. We started uh, we end, started off with a discussion of the modal model last week. Uh, and this, of course, is that model of um, short-term and long-term memory that was dominant in the 1960s and 1970s and probably still influences how we think about memory, right? We often think about memory as something that we're conscious of, short-term information, things that we're actively working on, and just our long-term knowledge base. So this distinction between short and long-term memory is pretty pervasive. The modal model was restricted though, uh, in the sense that it has made the assumption that the primary way or the only way to get information into your long-term memory was to rehearse it somewhere, uh, to practice it, to do something with it, whether that's an inner voice or an inner eye or to, you know, continue to do an action. That was the way to get things into your long-term memory. And it doesn't account very well for some of the other mechanisms uh, that allow you to encode information. So we're gonna talk about some of those other ways uh, to encode and rehearse information. The other problem with the modal model, which we'll get to on Wednesday, uh, is that it doesn't account for how memory influences your behavior without your awareness. The assumption is from the modal model that if you're going to remember something, it's brought back into your conscious short-term memory. Uh, so when you wanna do something, you need to remember it and you're actively thinking about it. So it misses these kind of un unconscious or implicit uh, effects of memory. So let's talk about how you can rehearse information. So how is information transferred from your uh, working memory or short-term memory or conscious experience uh, into a, a long-term store? Uh, there are two ways we're gonna discuss today. One is this uh, rehearsal in working memory or what we're gonna call maintenance rehearsal. That's that inner voice that we talked about last week, uh, being able to repeat a series of numbers or words or chunks of information over and over again, like a loop. Uh, until you need to use it. Uh, and then often the information uh, is not remembered. Uh, or if you rehearse it enough, it is remembered uh, long enough to be able to use, uh, to use it. But I also want to talk about elaborative rehearsal as well. Uh, one of the examples in which our intention or how we encode information and how we try to rehearse information comes about from an experiment or a study that was done on the way in which people study for uh, recall information versus recognition. Uh, does anybody, anybody give me a quick definition of recall versus recognition in memory tasks? So what's a recognition task versus a recall task? Uh, I'm just guessing. Um, recognition sounds like more implicit. It sounds like more of an unconscious process, kind of like uh, the tension of like visual binding and then recall is explicit to part of you have to say it out loud, you have to process it. That's close. So you've got some of the information there. So within uh, within a memory task, a recognition task is one in which you can say yes or no, I recognize that item as having been presented before. So you recognize the experience of something that has happened to you before. Recall is uh, within this literature is when you explicitly recall and uh, list the things that are in your memory. Uh, that's a slight difference. It's a subtle difference and they overlap, of course, right? Uh, the processes that are used to recall information are similar to those that are used to recognize information. Uh, when you're studying for an exam, this is a multiple choice exam in this class, do you study differently? How do you study for a multiple choice? If you know it's a multiple choice test, how do you study for a multiple choice exam yes. typically, whether it's this class or another class? What are some studying strategies? Uh, you go through the learning outcomes on the textbook and the vocabulary and you make flashcards for it. Flashcards, you know what, what, does anybody else do flashcards? Uh, flashcards are common when there's a lot of terms. What are some other techniques for multiple choice tests specifically? What about, oh yes. Uh, process of elimination. Process of elimination, which depends a lot on recognition, right? Uh, so you need to recognize something that is the correct answer and eliminate those things that you don't recognize uh, as being correct answers. That's sometimes where you run into trouble. That's where I would run into trouble on a multiple choice test is some of the things which are not right answers, you still recognize, right? Because they're common terms or they're things that were discussed in class but not exactly the right answer for that question. So recognition can actually be a challenge in multiple choice questions. How about when you study for a written exam or an essay exam where you know you have short answers and long answers, do you study for that information differently? 
what are some techniques to study to do well on an essay exam or a written exam? Focus on understanding the concepts. So focus on understanding the concepts. And that's, I think that's the biggest distinction. That doesn't mean you wouldn't understand the concepts for multiple choice exams, right? Uh, and that it doesn't mean that you wouldn't also focus on recognizing terms. But I think most of us uh, see that distinction, that when you know the items are going to be presented, there's a lot of them, and you've got to recognize and process of elimination, uh, figure out what the right choice is, that we study for that information in a different way. We try to recognize individual pieces of information. We want to recognize that exact term connected with its definition as opposed to thinking about what things mean or thinking about connections between concepts, which is how most of us study uh, for written exams. Um, now, for most of us, we get the kind of exam that we expected, right? In this class, I think the course outline says it'll be a multiple choice question exam, does it? I think my course, well, if, even if the course outline didn't say it, I've, we've been talking about it for a while now. So it's gonna be a multiple choice uh, exam. Uh, you probably would study for it in the way you would normally study for a multiple choice exam. You probably would feel a little irritated uh, or maybe even more so if you came in for the exam and it was a different format, right? I mean, you probably would be able to have a legitimate complaint uh, in a class uh, or a grievance against the instructor if they said you should expect a multiple choice question, you come in and it's an essay exam instead of uh, a written exam because you didn't prepare for it in the right way. You learn the information expecting something and then getting a different kind of uh, test. Uh, so a study that really influenced a lot of this uh, is one that was done in the, in the early 1970s. So today's class, I'm going to talk about three different uh, landmark memory papers, uh, all of which were done sort of in this uh, critical era of uh, the cognitive psychology of memory, sort of in this 1970s to 1980s era. Uh, and this is a study that Barbara Traversky carried out, looking at how students uh, and individuals in general learn information. Now, she's not using it within the context of an exam. She's going to ask people to learn pictures uh, and a word that goes along with each picture. But what she found was that when people expect a recognition test, when they study for recognition, they study specific details, kind of like what one of you suggested, which was uh, being able to put things together specifically or being able to recognize something by process of elimination. So really going for a specific term as opposed to studying for recall, which is being able to maybe have a more general understanding. Uh, and that's what she found. So uh, here's how she carried out the uh, test. There's a lot of text up here. I just wanna highlight a few things. Uh, pictures of objects, slides of line drawings of familiar objects, just like I'm presenting up here on the PowerPoint, except they would be one picture at a time uh, with the name of the object as well. Very straightforward things. Um, and then they're eventually going to be asked uh, to remember these things. And they're going to be doing it in several different ways. First of all, everyone gets an instruction. The instruction is plan to recall these or plan to recognize these. So you study for a recall test, you study for a recognition test. Of those people who study for a recognition test, half of them receive the test that they expected recognition first, and the other half received the other kind of test. Then everybody receives the other half of uh, the second test. Um, so here's what they were told. Subjects expecting, in other words, if you're planning for recall, this is an experiment of memory for pictures. I will project on the screen a series of 30 pictures of familiar objects with their names, one after the other, for about two seconds apiece. Afterwards, your task will be to write down the names of as many of the objects as you can remember in any order, any questions, right? Standard recall test. Here's what you're gonna learn when you're done, write them down and recall all of the information in any order. Um, the, uh, the, these pictures are then presented two seconds each uh, and they're told first, um, so some of these subjects receive the kind of test they plan for. They receive the recall test. Please write down the names of as many objects in the pictures that you can remember in any order. So they were told to do that, and then they were asked to do that. So that's a match right there. Um, subjects, some subjects, another half of the subjects that were planned to study for a recall test, 
got a recognition test first. So before we proceed to the test of recall that you planned for, I want to test your recognition. And then they do a yes, no judgment. So did I feel, did I remember it? And do I feel confident in remembering it? Does that seem clear to everyone? So you plan for recall, half of you get recall, the other half get recognition first and then recall. Um, subjects, the other half of the subjects were randomly assigned to the recognition study condition. In this experiment of memory for pictures, I will project, same thing, except then they're asked, when you're done, I'm gonna test your recognition. Uh, so they get a recognition test, afterwards they get a recall test. So here's what she found. First of all, uh, the key thing is that studying for explicit recognition uh, seemed to improve the scores overall. Uh, you'll notice that if you studied for recognition, uh, your performance on the recognition task, uh, whether you were given a recall task first or a recognition task first, was significantly higher than the subjects who planned to get a recall test. Tversky's uh, suggestion or her interpretation of these results is that when you plan to test a recognition memory, when you plan for recognition memory, you plan to remember as much detail about that object as you can. So that if you see something similar on the recognition test, you'll be able to disambiguate or distinguish that individual event. So this kind of studying for explicit recognition seemed to improve not only recognition, but it improved recall as well, because all of the processes that were put into place to study all those details uh, seem to allow for more information to be stored. Uh, there wasn't much of an effect for recall. So subjects who studied uh, for the recall of information, they're studying higher level concepts. Uh, likely, according to Tversky, they focused more just on the concept itself rather than the specific image. In other words, they focused on the basic level category that was being presented rather than on that particular exemplar. And so as a result, uh, their performance uh, on their recall task was, uh, was not any better than those who studied for a different kind of test, but even their performance on the recognition test in particular uh, was reduced. Uh, so studying for explicit recognition, not only what the thing is, but the specific details, uh, uh, seems to allow people to do better on both kinds of tests. The implication is, if you pay attention to concept level information, but also detail information, uh, you're likely to be able to encode more information, create a richer semantic network. Does that seem pretty clear? So this raises the suggestion that uh, we have a lot of expectations around the situations that we're in when we encode information. Uh, most of us uh, have a bias for um, encoding and recalling information in the same kind of setting. Uh, you probably all have been in this situation. You probably think about cognitive psychology when you're in this class, right? Because this is class time. Uh, and in fact, if we came back here, you'd probably be able to remember the information better than if you studied in an alternative uh, location. Most of us, you probably study in lots of different places. Is that right? Uh, you probably try to distribute your studying in different times and different locations and with different people uh, and under different scenarios so that the information is fairly resilient and not tied to one particular place or one particular location. And there's a reason for that. Uh, and that comes from the idea of context specific memory. Most of us use not only the local context, all sorts of contexts to remember how uh, to remember specific pieces of information. Uh, here's another study, again, from the mid 1970s. Uh, and this one is actually really kind of wild, <laughs> uh, the way this study was done. So uh, this is from Alan Badley, whose research, uh, whose name you probably remember from the working memory model. Uh, but he was also interested in the, uh, the processes uh, that people go through when they learn to encode information. Um, and in this case, they were interested in context-dependent information. Uh, at the time, in the 1970s, it wasn't clear, the evidence wasn't clear that there would be such a thing as a context-specific memory effect. Context-specific memory says you remember things better if you're in the same context when you recall them 
as you were when you first encoded them, because you can use contextual cues, whether they're uh, acoustical cues or spatial cues, the room that you're in, the time of day, and so on. So they tested this in a fairly extreme manner. Um, they managed to uh, get a group of uh, divers who were practicing for a di university diving club. Uh, so these are people who are doing scuba diving. I don't know, has anybody ever done scuba diving like up in Tobermory or anything like that? I haven't, I'm terrified to go down and something like that. You do some that. But it seems really interesting. Uh, so they found some uh, people who are training uh, to be scuba divers. Uh, and what they did was they reasoned that suppose uh, you were learning some words, list of words, while you were underwater. Uh, being underwater, all the things that come with that, uh, you know, not just being underwater, but also being connected to the scuba apparatus, uh, having to regulate your breathing uh, and the different surroundings, the temperature, uh, and the, you know, slightly heightened anxiety, perhaps, of being underwater connected to the scuba apparatus would all be part of what you were learning, not just the list of words. Uh, in the same way, if you were up on the beach uh, and not underwater, that would become part of the context as well. And they suspected that if you learn stuff underwater, you would recall stuff better while you were underwater, that there would be a context match. You'd be underwater and you'd say, okay, I'm underwater. Now I can remember those words again. Uh, and that's how they uh, carried the study out. So. Uh, they set up a, uh, an underwater dive. Now, remember, this is 1970s, but essentially, uh, these are telephone cables that connect to the divers, uh, communicate with bone conductance. You've probably seen those kind of headphones, which don't go in your ear, but they can uh, conduct uh, sound through, your, uh, uh, through the bones. Uh, that way, it allows you to use the SUBA breathing apparatus without losing uh, any of the sound. Essentially, these people were on a on a beach, uh, and they were asked uh, to regulate their breathing, become comfortable with it, uh, and then they learned lists of words on a tape. Uh, so these were being played uh, over their headphones, which were, again, these bone conducting headphones. Uh, they're learning list of words. They said, here's list one, here's list two, uh, and so on. Uh, so while they're already under a lot of stress uh, learning how to dive, so these are people who are engaged in diving lessons, uh, they're also being asked to learn these lists of words. Uh, and this wasn't in a swimming pool. Apparently, this was like in an open water site uh, in Scotland, uh, which I assume is kind of cold uh, and has additional context around it. Right? So this is not a normal learning environment. Uh, one prediction is that people would not learn the list of words very well underwater at all because they're concentrating on everything else that you would have to do. I didn't see if anybody raised their hand when I said, have you ever done any... Uh, scuba diving or free diving, but you can imagine if you haven't, uh, that it requires you to keep track of a lot of things, not only regulating your breathing, uh, but also your surroundings, right? It's not a natural surrounding for most of us to be in. So you got to keep track of a lot of stuff. Your attention is otherwise occupied. So one prediction is they wouldn't learn these lists very well at all. But the other prediction, Badley's prediction, is that the context would be a useful retrieval cue uh, and that it would be encoded along with the words. So not only do the words get encoded by themselves, but they get encoded with the context in which you are learning them. Due to a series of technical difficulties, two subjects were eventually dropped from the program. They don't say why. Um, that worried me a little bit. <laughs> They don't say what the technical difficulties are. Here's their results. Uh, here's your learning environment, dry and wet. Dry is up on the beach, wet is underwater. And you can see that if you learn dry and you recall dry, you do pretty well. If you learn wet and you recall wet, you do relatively well. So there's a significant effect of learning, uh, of encoding condition with retrieval condition. Uh, if you learn dry and you recall wet, not so good. Uh, you're not doing as well underwater as when you learned up on the beach. Uh, if you learn wet and you try to recall dry, again, not so good. It's almost a complete crossover interaction between these two. So it's the match condition that seems to do really well. Uh, and this result, this general result, although this is a sort of a one-off, no one would easily be able to redo this particular experiment uh, in exactly the same way. This is an example of research that would be difficult to reproduce, right? Because you'd have to get the same uh, environment, the same kind of uh, scuba apparatus and so on. But the idea 
of context specific memory has come up in a lot of other places. So afterwards, after Badley's study, lots of other studies have found this same effect generalizes to lots of different uh, surroundings. So for example, if you're induced to be in a positive mood or a negative mood, uh, and you learn information in that mood state, you tend to recall it better in the same mood state. Uh, if you learn with a specific background noise or background music, you have an, a recall advantage uh, when you recall the information in the presence of that same noise. Uh, and these things can be spatial as well. So you can learn information in one room and then recall it in another room. Yes. Uh, does this uh, still occur while chewing gum? Like I heard uh, like stories about that, but I don't know if it's a good myth or not. Well, I don't, so the, if you're chewing gum and you, you chew that same flavor and while taking a test, apparently recall is better, but I don't know if that's a, uh, well, I, I don't know specifically that study, but I mean, it's reasonable within the context if we're talking about that. So for some things like that, so if you didn't hear the question, uh, the question was, if I chew, uh, you know, I guess watermelon flavored gum uh, while I'm learning some information, and then later on, I can switch between mint gum and watermelon flavored gum or no gum, the watermelon gum is going to encourage a better recall because that's the matches the situations in which you learned it. Yeah, probably it would. I don't know specifically about a study that's looked at that, but it wouldn't be unreasonable in this context. Now, they'd be small effects, right? Uh, these would not be very overwhelming effects because gum flavor is a small thing. It's much, much more localized than being underwater. Uh, but the idea is the same. Uh, and that's why I think most of us, and I think you all sort of nodded your head when I suggested that when you study for exams, uh, you do tend to vary the location. You want to have a lot of variability uh, in how you study for things. You want to have a lot of diversity in training, different times of day, uh, different locations, so that you don't tie the recall of information for one class just to this classroom. Uh, you, you learned things here in this class, and then you came back and studied in this classroom. That would be great if all the exams were in this classroom. But of course, they're not. Uh, and when we have final exams, uh, you typically go to a different time, place, and location, right? Everything is different when you take a final exam. So the idea is you want to be able to uh, study in lots of other locations so that you can minimize the effects of context rather than maximize the effects of context. Uh, sometimes the effects of context can get a little bit too overwhelming. I don't know about you, but last year, um, did you all do everything online last year? Last year was an all online year from roughly uh, March of 2020 uh, until like now. Uh, so a long time, it's like 500 days of doing online. Did you find that everything started to blend in uh, and kind of you couldn't tell one class from the other? I did find this to be very much a problem for me by the end of the summer and into the fall last year. The courses that I were teaching, so I was teaching two classes, this one and my uh, third year class, I was doing them both on Zoom live from my uh, bedroom office at home, right? So everything looked the same other than a, rather than going to a different classroom on a different time of day, I was basically sitting in the same office uh, looking at the same camera on the same uh, monitor every day. Plus, I used exactly the same location for meeting with all of my graduate students, uh, for all of my department meetings, uh, for anything else I was doing, in addition to the actual research work that I was doing, uh, working on the book that I was writing, uh, and just general screwing around on whether it's a game or uh, on the internet, right? So everything was being done in exactly the same location. It really all sort of blended in. In other words, context was, was overwhelming in that case. I couldn't remember one thing from the next because everything had the same context. So I would, there were a couple of times when I'd start talking to one of my grad students and I'd forget exactly which project we were talking about because I met with them the previous week to talk about something else, uh, maybe a class that we were talking about. So it did become a bit of a challenge when context doesn't vary everything started to have that context effect and I couldn't tell one thing from the other. Uh, is that also, does that also partially explain why we observe the phenomenon that when we walk through a door, sometimes we forget what we were thinking about? Yes, that's exactly right. And I do the same thing. And I think a lot of us do, right? Uh, and that's why I think I even mentioned this last week. If I, I would ask you to sort of email me something, if we talk about it after class and you ask a question, I'll often say, can you please send me a message on Teams or an email? to remind me, because when I leave this 
classroom <laughs> and I go back to my office, then I remember the things I was working on right before I left my office. And I'm not thinking about the class uh, because I'm thinking about different things. That's a good thing for the most part because you concentrate on some things in one room, other things in another room, uh, but it's not so good when everything is in the same room. And I found that I'm sure many of you did when I was doing all of my work from the same computer in the bedroom office for a year and a half, uh, it did start to get a little bit bland, right? There was no context effects because everything started to cease. So these can help, but they can also uh, hurt a little bit by including uh, the same context for everything that you need to remember. Uh, so let's finish with a discussion of elaborative rehearsal. Uh, elaborative rehearsal takes a, a different take on context. Now we're gonna talk not about the uh, local context of the environment that you're learning the information in, but rather the context of the information itself. Uh, so information that is similar uh, will be learned because it reinforces itself. If you're learning concepts around, you know, words around a certain concept, those things will reinforce each other because they, uh, they have an internal reinforcement. They, re they activate other areas of your semantic uh, memory. So maintenance rehearsal, uh, which is what we've talked about uh, when we discuss um, this inner voice of this phonological loop. That's when you repeat information to yourself. Now, that's a good way to remember information that doesn't have much context. It's a good way to remember uh, a, a list of seven things or seven chunks or seven digits, uh, but it's not such a good way to remember information for an exam uh, or to remember information for a story that you want to tell somebody, or if you're remembering information for uh, a discussion that you want to have with someone, you want to think of your specific points that you want to make, trying to memorize those all probably isn't going to be very efficient. What you want to do is think about what they actually mean. So this form of elaborative rehearsal uh, is when you want to learn something, you elaborate on each piece of information and you pay attention to what the information, uh, how it's related to other information uh, or how the things are related to other things in their surroundings, uh, surrounding context, uh, or how the information is related to what you already know. So it's a way to process information uh, such that you're elaborating as much as possible on the semantic character of that information. In other words, you think about what the information is, uh, what you know about it, uh, and you connect it to other things that you know, and that can help you remember it because it relies on building, uh, con taking advantage of the context in the existing semantic memories that you already have. Uh, this does require a little bit more effort, right? So there's effort required here uh, because you have to elaborate on the information. But one of the payoffs is that it does usually uh, mean that you're going to have better uh, retention of that information later on. Uh, so this comes from work, again, in the 1970s. More than any of the other papers on what I talked about today, this one really challenged uh, the dominant view. Uh, in other words, this really challenged that modal view and suggested that we can learn things sometimes without even trying. Uh, this, this work was done uh, by Fergus Craik uh, and Lockhart. Uh, this is from the University of Toronto. Uh, and Craik and Lockhart suggested that anytime you're learning information, learning information with a semantic character to it, uh, you can process it in multiple ways simultaneously. You can pay attention to the surface characteristics, uh, the surface characteristics being uh, sort of the shape or the uh, edges or the words, the letters that words are made of, the colors, that kind of thing, so perceptual information. Uh, and that's important. Um, but you can also pay attention to the semantics of what you're trying to learn. In other words, what the information means. Their argument, and what their results suggest, is that shallow processing and deeper processing differ from each other because deeper processing generally uh, results in better recall of the information. Uh, here's what they did in their study. So this is uh, a study of the depth of processing and the retention of words. Uh, you'll notice that a lot of these studies from the 1970s uh, look at people learning lists of words. Uh, it's a convenient way to study memory. It's not the only aspect of memory, but it's a convenient way uh, to study what people can remember and how they can remember. 
Um, and here's how they carried out their experiments. So uh, subjects in a lot of their experiments were asked to learn lists of words. But rather than just study the list of words, uh, they were asked to answer a single question every time they saw a word. So this is different from some of the other things that we talked about where subjects would just be read a list of words, they would hear a list of words and then try to recall them. In this case, uh, you see the word uh, and you're given a condition uh, where you have to answer a question. So in the structural condition, for example, uh, subjects learning lists in the, word, in the structural condition would be asked, is the word in capital letters? And you would say yes or no for the word table. So in this example, table is the word that you're going to learn. Uh, and the question you have to answer is lowercase or capital. Uh, now, of course, you can see that you could answer this question without really reading the word or encoding it very deeply or even thinking about it, right? All you need to do is quickly identify a capital letter and you've already answered the question. So you can do this quickly. You can do it without reading. You can even do it for non-words. So you wouldn't even need to read these words to be able to answer the question. Um, does the word rhyme? And then you're given a possible rhyme and you say yes or no. Is the word a type of something? This is a category information. Here you can see that in order to answer that question, uh, you have to think about what the word is. So it doesn't do to just look at the letters or like in the rhyme condition where you have to at least read it. Uh, here you need to have an existing conceptual knowledge of what that thing is and how it relates to other concepts. In a sentence, would it fit? He met a blank in the street. So is this something that you can meet on the street? So each one of these requires you to think about the word in a slightly different way. One of them emphasizing the structure capital letters, others uh, emphasizing the semantics of it. And what they found across a number of different studies uh, is that recognition improved with the depth of processing. Uh, so structural information, capital letters, no capital letters, fairly low recognition happening pretty quickly. Uh, but when they had to think about the sentence condition or the category conditions, recognition performance was much higher. Uh, there was a there was a much uh, there was a significant advantage or an improvement on what they could remember, and they spent a little bit more time answering each question as well. So they study the words by answering questions, and then they're asked to recognize the words from old and new words, and you do better. Everybody gets the same words, right? So this is not an issue of just exposures. The number of exposures is equal across all subjects. Uh, what matters here is how you process the work. Um, in other conditions, uh, for example, uh, when you can see uh, both for latency, which is reaction time, uh, but also for recognition, uh, when they're asked to do case, uh, not so good. When they're asked to rhyme, the yes and no answers differ from each other. Uh, when they're asked to do recognition, uh, their performance uh, increases. So this is called a level of processing effect. Uh, in one study, they even demonstrated that you can uh, show these basic effects uh, even when you don't expect a test at all. Uh, so in two of their experiments, uh, they presented subjects with the list of words with these questions, uh, but they weren't told, half of the subjects were not told to memorize them at all. They weren't told to learn them for recognition. They weren't told to learn them for recall. Uh, this is what's known as the incidental condition. So in the incidental encoding condition, uh, you just learn the words by answering those questions, never told anything about a memory test. Uh, and then at the end of the experiment, you're asked, uh, do you recognize these words? And they show the same general effect. Uh, they're still showing the response latency effect. Uh, and they're still showing uh, on this previous slide here, I got these out of order, I'm sorry. Uh, on the previous experiment, uh, they're still showing uh, the recognition advantage. Uh, so the advantage for deeper processing, levels of processing and this elaborative encoding uh, seems to exist even when you're not trying to learn the words. Uh, so this sort of works against that modal model. Uh, the idea that you need to rehearse things to learn them. Uh, what Traver what uh, Craig uh, and uh, Talving are showing uh, is that this uh, level of processing effect is enough to be able to encode, contain, and recall information uh, later on. So 
I want to summarize this, uh, but then I want to forecast something briefly that I'm going to talk about. Oh, yes. Uh, I guess I guess I was not being asked my question. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. Before I go to the last slide, any other questions? So one of the things that you're going to see uh, in the online lecture, uh, just to forecast, which I also recorded today, uh, is an example of a lot of memory errors that come about because of exactly the same finding. So the same things that let you uh, encode, rehearse, and recall information without trying, uh, so this level of processing effect, can also result in memory error. So if you can learn things without trying, you can also recall things that you didn't learn because of, a, because of this elaborative encoding process. So the maintenance rehearsal may not, I'm not sure what that word is supposed to be, uh, may, does not seem to help you store information in long-term memory. Uh, we've shown that last week and earlier this, in today's class, that just repeating stuff may not be enough. Uh, in uh, Craig uh, and Tulving's work, uh, the level of exposures, the number of exposures was equated across the two different conditions, uh, or the three different conditions, or the four different conditions. Mm -hmm. All of these level of processing conditions were the same in terms of the number of exposures. It was the way in which you encoded the information that seemed to make a difference. So the elaboration, uh, creating associations does seem to help you remember things, uh, suggesting that you can store a lot of things in your, in, in your memory without necessarily trying to. Uh, this is true whether it's context, uh, this is true uh, for local context, this is true for semantic context. Okay, we finished up with three minutes to go. Yes. For the last three, uh, for the last study, sorry, was the first <laughs> Yes, so the first study that I suggest that I showed uh, subjects were told uh, that they were going to expect a recognition test. Uh, and most of the studies, that's how it was run. But at least in uh, that second study uh, that I told you about, uh, experiment three and four, uh, where the subjects were given the incidental condition, uh, they were not informed of a recognition test. And that still seemed to show the same effect. They showed the same general advantage. Yes. Uh, could you explain that? Like, like, um, so the elaboration means that you tend to recall the information more better. So could that be explained by like, the fact that like, semantic networks are like, spreading activity? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so the, if you didn't hear the question, uh, the explanation here uh, is it maps onto your existing spreading activation and semantic networks. Uh, in this experiment, it's helpful. It helps you remember stuff. But in the online lecture on memory errors, uh, the same effect, spreading activation, is going to be the mechanism that produces memory errors. Oh, okay. Okay. Is that good? So, like, wait, so how does... Because you can activate things that haven't been presented. Uh, so suppose you're presented with a number of things, it activates other information. When you come back uh, to recall that information, then you may mistakenly think that you saw those words because they were activated anyway. Exactly. Exactly, exactly. And that's what I talk about in the online lecture. But like the central here behind the activation. Yes. Okay, yeah. Exactly. All right, see you all on Wednesday. Hold on, I just wanna stop the recording. Bye. The possible cost of the school is going high. I'm like, okay, not late.